some key assumptions. Okay, the first is this: this is heavily skewed uh, towards European regulatory frameworks. Uh, we're in Europe at the moment. I am based in Europe. You could argue that the European regulatory space is the most developed. Um, it's essentially what I know best. Uh, there is a bias and there is a skew, so you'll have to forgive me. The second assumption is that the Monero community wishes for Monero to be embedded into the evolving digital payment sphere. If we don't want that, or that is not a motivation, you can probably discount 90% of what I say today. The third assumption is that Monero remains a legal crypto asset. At the moment, there is no prohibition on the trading of Monero. There is no hard law that restricts the trading of Monero, but there is, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, some soft law that is coming in that imposes stricter requirements on those that wish to transact with Monero. The main caveat here is that I am not a lawyer. There's probably some lawyers in the audience. I know there's some risk assessors in the audience. I know there's um, cybersecurity experts. I know there's compliance experts. I know there's business managers. I'm not necessarily gonna provide you with any answers. I'm just here to kickstart a discussion. At a very high level, these are the participants in the digital payment sphere. Each of these social groupings or each of these group groupings has had a say in the conversation to get us where we are now. Each of them has had a stake in the ground. Now, admittedly, some voices have been louder than others. Some stakes have been longer, deeper, and sharper than others. That's the reality of the situation. Just some important considerations about this. Number one is that central banks do not want capital flight from the existing fiat monetary system. Number two, law enforcement also do not want capital flight from the existing financial monetary system, albeit for different reasons. The third thing to remember is that commercial banks, exchanges, and wallet providers, depending on what services they offer their consumers, have to do exactly what the regulations tell them that they have to do. If they want to remain operating in the jurisdiction they reside, they have to do what the regulations say. The fourth thing to remember, and arguably this is the most important but the least talked about, is that grouping up in the top right-hand corner, the anybody else, is best represented by the ad tech industry. The ad tech industry is worth 200 billion a year in Europe. It's worth 800 billion a year globally. And they are looking at the digital payment space and they want a piece of that pie. They are seeing digital payments move to open public transparent ledgers. They are understanding that those open public transparent ledgers are actually open public transparent data lakes and they want to extract value from all that data. I'm gonna go down a level and talk a little bit about some definitions. Now we could sit here all day and we could discuss these definitions, whether they're right, whether they're wrong, what, how, what, to what degree they're right, to what degree they're wrong. The only reason I'm presenting these definitions is that they were recently presented um, by a representative of the IMF. For those of you who don't know, the International Monetary Foundation have a very strong voice in the conversations and a very deep and sharp stake. These definitions frame the current evolving conversation around central bank digital currencies. These same definitions are going to be applied to crypto assets, and these same definitions are going to be applied to or are applicable to Monero. Why does all that matter? It matters because there are a host of regulations that currently exist. There are a host of regulations that currently exist are in the process of being amended. There are a host of regulations that are due to come into force. And there are a host of regulations that currently exist and are due to be amended to account for definitions that are provided to us by the regulators. On the last slide, there was a sticker that essentially said that Monero was anonymous money. From my perspective, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to achieve an anonymous money, especially when there's a public database of all transactions. Now, anonymous money is an idealized state. Perhaps that idealized state is what keeps us all incentivized and keeps us all motivated to keep going, but whether or not we'll ever get there is still an unknown. 
the regulations that are around now are starting to define each end of the spectrum. So the spectrum exists between identity, traceability, transparency, and anonymity. The regulations will define each end of the spectrum and they'll define each step along the spectrum. It's important just to remember that. This list is essentially a top-down list, loosely. Just some important ones to take note of. The sixth, the sixth anti money laundering directive, which is currently in its amendment cycle. It's actually a suite or a package of regulations. They are due to start coming into force in 2024. Most of you have probably heard of MICA, which is the Market and Crypto Assets Regulation. The final text of that has been agreed uh, within the European Parliament and the European Council, and that is also due to come into effect in 2024 in a phased rollout. The two next on that list are the Payment Service Directive 2, or the second Payment Services Directive. That is due to go into an amendment cycle, and it will start to account for crypto assets. The fourth on, or the fifth on that list is EIDAS 2, which is the European Identity and Trust Services Regulation, also known as the EU Digital Identity Act. The only reason I'm mentioning the Digital Identity Act is because digital identity is going to have a, a huge implications for a number of sectors and specifically the financial sector in the short to medium term. I'm gonna take a little diversion and cross over to the United States. This piece of text was released in 2019 by the Financial Crime Enforcement Network. It was the first display of techno-social political power and the first attempt to delineate or make distinctions or demarcate from a privacy perspective between two types of crypto assets, traceable, transparent crypto assets and privacy preserving or privacy affording crypto assets. It was followed up by the US Department of Treasury in 2020, where further distinctions were made and there were distinct references made to transaction flows, transaction history, and transaction blocks in which value transfers were mined. What are the implications? The main implication is that we're starting to see regulatory harmonization across the world. So those initial definitions of anonymity enhanced crypto assets or anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies have now made their way over to Europe and have been transcribed or transposed into European regulations. We are starting to see much more or many more direct references to things such as traceability, transparency, identifiability and linkability. As definitions go, traceability is the ability to connect a distinct um, transaction to an identity, whether a real or legal person. Linkability is the ability to group together a set of otherwise distinct transaction as being linked to the same value transfer flow. Ultimately, what does this mean? There are two things. The FATF guidance, otherwise known as the travel rule, has been transposed into the MICA regulation, or excuse me, has been transposed into one regulation which has been part of the sixth anti money laundering directive. It is called the regulation on the information accompanying the transfer of funds and specific crypto assets. But secondly, within the sixth anti money laundering directive, we have seen the exemption for anonymous transfers been removed completely. So in the fifth anti money laundering directive, there was an exemption for transfers below a thousand euros that has now been removed completely. The caveat there is that we have not seen the final texts and there could be some member states that will push back against the removal of that exemption, but I wouldn't hold my breath. Lastly, and potentially most importantly, we have seen this bit of text. This is part of the MICA regulation, Market and Crypto Assets. It's found its way into now Article 76, Clause 3. How this small piece of text is interpreted in the crypto space and how this small piece of text is enforced in the crypto space is going to have massive ramifications for how and where Monero can situate itself within the digital payment sphere. As I said earlier, there are two distinct pathways for Monero. It's not clear which is the best pathway. It's not clear which is the most preferred pathway. It's not clear what is the most impactful 
from the Monero community or for society as a whole. I'm going to leave it there and I'll open the floor to kind of questions, comments, observations and in a perfect world, concrete plans of action.